Two. All right, Thank look, you. two shotter. We like you. That's it. Have no idea. Make sure well documented. Thank you. My name is Don Reitzis. I'm the interim chair in sociology and associate dean for social and behavior science in the College of Arts and Science. And I'm here because I've had a lifelong interest in the Rosenwald Foundation, not the least of which is that my mother used to work for the organization. And she was involved in the party that brought the fund to a close in 1948. So growing up, I would hear stories about some of the special things that the Rosenwald Foundation had done. And it really wasn't until I saw this documentary that I really got a full understanding about the breadth of some of the exciting projects that the Rosenwald Fund sponsored. Not the least of which were the building of schools throughout the South, which I think is one of the major accomplishments of the Fund. Julius Rosenwald was not the founder, but he was the person who took Sears and made it the uh, tremendously large and successful um, commercial operation that it became. That, that he really pioneered the idea of, of warehousing and distributing um, merchandise through a mail order kind of distribution system. He made a fortune in the early 20th century and he spent from sometime around 1915 to his death in the 1930s giving that money away with Booker T. Washington who was president of Tuskegee Institute that they identified that there was a tremendous need for public schools in poor rural African-American neighborhoods in the South. So in conjunction with Tuskegee, um, Mr. Rosenwald began a project that helped to build eventually 5,000 rural schools. So that was one of the things he did. Okay. Another thing that, that he did was if any people listening to this have been in Chicago, he built the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. That was his idea, he completely funded it. Um, and then a third thing he did that was sort of special was through a fellowship program, he helped fund African-American artists, painters, and scholars to give them special opportunities to enhance their craft and their science and to, make, to enable them to um, develop some of the skills and some of the opportunities that um, can make them better artists and professionals. We're at Georgia State University. Did you sign in? Did you sign in? First and foremost, how do people like the film? Yeah? Amazing. It's so interesting. Um, I heard about this film, I think like nine months ago, and I was just, you know, looking up some different documentaries to look at, and I came across this and I was floored, mainly because I didn't know about this. I didn't know about the history about this man and what he did in partnership with African-American communities throughout this country. So what I decided to do since the work that we do at Greatest Minds, as all of you guys know here, my name is George Chip Ranch. I'm a PhD student in the illustrious department of sociology here at Georgia State. And um, what I wanted to do was to bring the story here. And that's why we have, um, this is our third of our series, of our film series that we've had in June over the last three years at Georgia State. So I want to thank all of you guys for actually coming and participating in this because this is something we really uh, appreciate here on campus. Um, before I bring our panelists up, um, I want to say hello to a couple of special guests. Um, first of all, we have in the audience, you have your Vice President of Student Affairs here, Dr. Douglas Covey, right over there, say hello. All right. Um, you guys don't know, that is what we call big man on campus. And he wanted to make sure when I told him about this uh, event, he made sure he put it in his calendar because he wanted to be here with all of you guys today. So I thank you, Dr. Covey, for coming. And I know you are building and growing our school and getting perimeter on, on base with Georgia State. So we know it's a very busy schedule. We're so glad that you're here today. Thank you so much. Um, also, we have the president. Is our president of the student government still here? He might have just walked out. All right. We'll give it up for our brother Fortune, our new president of the Student Government Association. Give a hand round of applause. Thank you and so forth. And also, I'd like to say hello to a couple of my uh, faculty members here in my department. Dr. John Kim, is she still here? There we are. Hey, the wave! <laughs> and also, Dr. Deidre Oakley, who 
as she knows about to be my dissertation chair. <laughs> so I give it up, say thank you. Okay, so here's the part we wanted to talk to. We're gonna get you guys involved in this discussion as well. But I decided to bring three professors and also our associate dean um, here to talk about uh, Rosenwald. And so what I decided to do is that you guys have their biographies. We have Dr. Michael Sonanda, who is in the African American Studies Department. Please, we're going to be sitting right up here in the front. All right. We also have Dr. Don Freitzies, who is a professor in the Department of Sociology, but also the Associate Dean for Social and Behavioral Sciences. And also we have Dr. Monique Moultrie, who is in our religious our religious studies department. And so, first of all, I'd like for them to do is just talk about their thoughts of the film and how, um, and then just about Rosenwald in general, but how can we relate that to today about lessons about what we're, where we are in society in general with the elections and many things that are coming up in the world today. We just wanted them to bring it up to speed. And then what we're gonna do is to get uh, all of you in the audience to join in the conversation. So thank you so much. The combination of Booker T. Washington, the men and women at Tuskegee, and the Rosenwald people, it was such a brilliant organizing model in terms of both first the YMCA, but then in terms of the schools, that rather than have the Rosenwald family and later the fund build schools and just sort of drop them in the community, to make it, it a partnership where community people built it, it created ownership in the community so that these schools were really not Rosenwald schools, these were community schools and that uh, in investment and commitment and identification with the school was built into the very process by which it was funded and which it was created. So that as an, as an organizing model, I think it's, it's a tremendous and powerful model for community building that's still applicable today in, in social movements and in grassroots community organization. I think Julius Rosenwald would have been tickled at the thought that he would ever be compared with community organizers, but I, I think he had a profound understanding about how to leverage funds, but really to use matching funds as a way of actually building a base for community de for community development. And I think that that was one of the lessons for me in, in, in the film and, and learning more about him. The, the second thing is, is a little bit more of, a, of an open-ended question that we may want to talk about, and that's the, the Rosenwald Fund was started in the 20s with the idea that, that Mr. Rosenwald wanted it to, to be of his generation, to address the problems of his generation, and to be all the money to be distributed within, I think, something like 15 or 20 years of, his, of, his, of the founding of the fund. So the fund began in the 20s, and it ended in 1948, with the goal that all the money be completely used up. And so part of the reason that I think that the Rosenwald Fund may not be known it's not around anymore. It hasn't been around for so long. So that's the downside. I and mean, the upside was that he didn't want a foundation to be self-perpetuating and for the, the foundation board and the foundation staff to be stakeholders in the perpetuation of an organization of an institution. He wanted it to be directed at its mission and therefore to use all of its funds for the, the purpose of the organization. It's a noble idea, but it, I think it may have been better for them to have saved some money and to continue on a little bit longer, <laughs> continuing the success of what they had. It, it's an interesting question about creating organizations today that from the very beginning the idea is that they're time bound, that, that they're to address the problems of their generation. So the Rosenwald Fund is addressing a problem in the segregated United States, and I think address it very powerful. And, and I think as, as Julian Vaughn said, it created a foundation for the the generation before the civil rights generation, which was the generation before the Obama generation. Yeah. The major artists and painters and scholars in the 20th century, how many people, their lives were touched by the Rosenwald Foundation, it's, it's just absolutely astounding. My mother was on the staff of the fellowship program, and she was the last living member of that, of that organization. And part of, of her job um, in the 1940s was to to go around and, and to meet people and, and to find out who were the rising stars that the Rosenwald Foundation could help. What I was most impressed with in the film is um, Mr. Rosenwald taking the concept of Tikkun Olam quite seriously. 
which literally, as the film said, means to repair the world, but it's to take a consciousness that you are to be in solidarity with those who are disadvantaged. And it is your job, if you are more advantaged, to repair that disadvantage. And I think how that relates to our current scenario, um, not only our political system and what's going on in November, but literally what's just happened over the weekend, mm -hmm. is that if we are literally called to consciousness to repair the world in the same way that he felt called to repair society that he was in, what great change each one of us is in, capable of embodying. And I, I think, to your point that you were making about the disbanding of the fund, when the film started, I remember that uh, part of my doctoral education was funded through the Ruth Bird Fund, which is a similar program uh, that's still running in New York City that's uh, started by a Jewish man um, who created great wealth, but also was still motivated by that same principle uh, that he wanted to use wealth for good. And I, I, I'm indebted and grateful, and I also think, why isn't that motto more so used when I think back? I think a couple of years ago, uh, several billionaires decided to give away, they were going to start strategically giving away a majority of their um, monies um, in the sense of you know, creating real social change in the world. And I think there should be more social action behind that, more implementation of that. Um, that is not just about your monetary resources, but about your skill sets. Also, using that to create social change. Mostly impressed first with how many people here on the summer night in the evening to watch this film. So that's a victory, George. Oh, it is. <laughs> um, one of the things that strikes me about this film is the time period. As a historian, um, you know, this is not a good time in America for a lot of people. There's extreme poverty because of the depression. There's tremendous violence against black people and Jews and people who are gay um, and Catholics. I mean, the majority of people lynched during this time were black people, but there were other groups who were equally attacked if they were found in the wrong places. Um, it's on the verge of Nazi, the Nazi rise in Europe. I mean, this is like a very pivotal moment in history and for someone to step forward in that moment and to create this kind of program in concert with a community that is, you know, extremely oppressed. And it speaks to how you really make change. You have to go to the root of things, to the core. And education, in 1900, almost 90% of black people were illiterate or functionally illiterate. And so the impact of this is tremendous, but the courage it takes to do it and um, you know, when I look at various periods in history, in the 20th century especially, and reminded of this with the death of the great champion Muhammad Ali, um, you know, we need courageous pe people in periods like this. And that's probably one of the issues that we're facing right now is that you know, we've lived in times of giants and now we have people who are grasshoppers trying to run the world. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, so it's kind of frightening, though. Know? I mean, the idea that you know ignorance would prevail, and um, so this film, I think, is very powerful because it reminds us of that. It reminds us that a person, albeit this person had great resources, but a person can effect tremendous change. And I think the, the point you made earlier about you know the narrative of a person giving money away is kind of what we hear about philanthropy, but more importantly is partnering with communities so that there's power from both sides, you know, that, that the people themselves are empowered and that that voice is heard and it's not just a gift given to them, but it's a partnership that it took to build these schools and to populate these schools and to graduate these students and communities to support every child that went to these schools. That's a big thing. We should learn from it.